Hi everybody, welcome to another episode on my channel. Today I, I'm here with Dr. Eric Turkheimer, who is the U. Scott Hamilton Professor of Psychology at the University of Virginia in the United States. So, Dr. Turkheimer, it's a real honor to have you on the show. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Nice to be here. Okay, great. Perfect. So, um, I guess I already had an interview with another person to talk about behavior genetics, Dr. Matt McGue from the University of Minnesota. Uh, yes. a couple of months ago and we already went through some of the basic concepts surrounding behavior genetics and so on uh, so and with you i would like to focus on on other ones that we didn't cover there um, and so to start off with uh, the four laws of behavioral genetics because i know that you were the author of the first three laws and then james lee from minnesota i think had the fourth law to the list so i would like to start off with exploring each of them individually uh, and see what they mean and their implications to a better understanding of behavior genetics so the first one uh, all human behavioral traits are heritable uh yes well you know, I think I think it's important that when you when you think about the three laws that I I I intended them a bit ironically. Uh, they're not intended. I mean, they're they're literally true, but uh, they they have a point, an ironic point beyond the literal meaning that everything's heritable. You know, when when I when I wrote that paper, uh, it was kind of at the end of the great era of twin studies um, and people had been doing twin studies for a long while and and when they started uh, I think people had a sense that well isn't this great we're going to you know people had thought about the nature nurture problem for a long time and they thought well now we're gonna have this method that's gonna allow us to divide the world up and we're gonna find that some things are really quite genetic and other things are more environmental and we'll learn how to tell them apart and what to do with more genetic things and more environmental things. Uh, and it didn't really work out that way. That, uh, you know, what, what I observed as a graduate student really was that by and large, all twin studies came out the same way. That they, they didn't divide the world up into genetic things and environmental things. They, they found pretty much universally that everything, all anything that varies, anything that differs among people, is moderately heritable. Um, and you know, at at first, when people were studying the obvious targets for those kinds of studies, human intelligence and personality and mental illness and all of those things, and one after another of them were turning out to be partially heritable. There was this wave of thinking, wow, the world is certainly turning out to be a much more genetic place than we we thought. Uh, but the, the funny thing that happened was that once people kind of ran out of all those obvious things, they moved on to other things. You know, how much TV do you watch? And uh, how often do you go to church? And what are your political attitudes like? And... Uh, are you married? Um, and all those things turned out to be just as heritable as all the official things, you know, all of the intelligence and personality things. And that, the, the point of the first law, ultimately, was sort of to put the brakes on the idea that since twin studies showed things to have a moderate heritability, that meant that the ultimate explanation for why people differed on those variables was going to be a genetic one. Because it seems natural to think, well, schizophrenia is heritable, so therefore, if we're going to understand why some people are schizophrenic, we have to look at their genes. But if being divorced is heritable, we might think twice about concluding that explaining why some people get divorced, we want to look at their genes. Uh, so, 
so anyway, I mean, really, the, the point of the first law is to observe that that's very true generally, but then to wonder whether the, the universality of it, in fact, winds up putting limitations on what the implications of heritability are. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it's very interesting that you touch on the twin studies because uh, the second law is the effect of being raised in the same family is smaller than the effect of the genes. But this, in fact, is not true for all behavioral traits, right? Uh, well, I don't know what you have in mind. It's uh... Uh, well, well, for example, I was thinking perhaps about uh perhaps not really to uh, about the second law but about the third law so for example in the case of um iq and intelligence uh, if, even though for some traits the non-shared environment has a bigger effect than the shared environment and that, that's why i'm focusing here now specifically about the third law and not the second one we'll get there but um but, but on the other hand, there, there are other traits, like if I'm not mistaken, the ones that are concerned to the big five personality traits, in which uh, the non-shared environment has a bigger effect than the shared environment, and the, and the genes count for about 50% of the heritability, right, of these traits, if I'm not mistaken, of course. Yes, yeah, so are we on the second law or the third law now? Uh, yeah, yes, the second law. I, I kind of mixed the, the two uh, up here, but yes. But, but j just to say that it's not true for all traits that the, um, the shared or the non-shared environment might have a smaller effect than the genetic side of things. The, it, well, might, the, it might the be similar. Law. Right. The second law is exclusively about shared, and the third law is about non-shared. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think it is pretty pretty universally true uh, that shared effects, in particular, are small in twin studies. Um, you know whether they're always smaller than the genetic portion or not. I, I'm sure you can you can you can find examples if you if you look at things that really obviously have to depend on your family of origin, like where you live or what religion you belong to. Um, you know the shared environment tends to account for a lot of the variability in those kinds of things. But anything that that would strike you as a psychological trait. Uh, the shared environment accounts for often very little, especially when people, once people are no longer children. Uh, and in many, in many ways, that's, I think that that's been a harder pill for people to swallow than the first law. I mean, there was a time before my time in the field when the idea that genes affected behavior at all was a, a deeply controversial and troubling idea. But I think people have actually gotten pretty used to that idea by now. I don't, I don't think people find it especially shocking. But all of us, on the other hand, we have an impression that our family and our parents and our familial circumstances has an effect on us. I mean, we have that impression about ourselves as children growing up. And we certainly have that impression as parents, where we invest a lot of effort into making decisions about how we raise kids and do we do this and do we do that. And it's troubling to learn that at least a literal reading, and I, I don't give it a strictly literal reading, but a literal reading of the twin study results say, well, your family doesn't actually matter that much environmentally. And there, there are people who've read it that way. Um, you know, David Rowe wrote a book called The Limits of Family Influence. Um, and that, and there have been people saying it again recently, sort of saying that parenting doesn't matter. Uh, now, I think it's, 
the reasons the shared environment looks so small are, are in fact very, very, very complicated. And I think it's easy to exaggerate them. Uh, and maybe, I mean, that might get us off on a bit of a tangent here, but uh, I think you have to be careful with that. I, I, think, I think it's wrong to conclude that how you parent your children doesn't matter on the basis of twin studies uh, for, for a number of reasons that are talked about in the paper. Uh, and then should we go on to the third law? Mm, uh, yes, uh, the third law is something like a substantial portion of the variation in complex human behavioral traits is not accounted for by the effects of genes or families. So here is where you put in or squeeze in the non-shared environment and the effects of it, right? Right. And, you know, the non-shared environment, I've always thought, is a bit of a misnomer that it's the the so-called non-shared environment refers to everything that makes identical twins raised in the same family different from each other and you know when people first thought about that they thought well there are the genes that the twins share there's the family that the twins share and then there's the rest of their environment that they don't share so that must be the non-shared environment. Um, but I think it turns out that it's, cert and it's certainly not just the aspects of the environment that you don't share with your twin or siblings that the non-shared environment is referring to. It's, you know, because if you study non-shared environmental things, how a parent treats one sibling as opposed to the other sibling, or what kind of teacher one sibling has as opposed to the other sibling, you really can't explain very much. Uh, and, and I think what turns out is that in, in human development, a, a very significant part of both the genetic and the environmental part of what happens to people when they grow up is extremely unsystematic. Uh, I mean, you know, we now know that all those things are heritable. It's not because there's a gene for IQ and a gene for personality. There are thousands of genes that are related to any complex human trait. They all intersect with each other in an incredibly complex way, and they all intersect with the environment. Uh, and the environment and the genes aren't independent of each other. People with certain kinds of genes come to be exposed to different kinds of environments. And the result of that is that human behavior, a big chunk of human behavior is for all practical purposes unpredictable. You, you can't predict it from first principles that, okay, we know what the genes are, we know what the environment is, let's put those together and predict how extroverted you're going to be. It just doesn't work. And that unpredictability, that unsystematic unpredictability is what the non-shared environment mm -hmm. contains. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think you already touched touch a little bit on the fourth law that is that was introduced again by James Lee from the University of Minnesota, that is human behavioral traits are polygenic. So I think for that for the general public here it is important. It's really important to understand that there's no gene for this or that, right? So for example, uh, during the 80s and the 90s, there was a big trend and even nowadays perhaps in the media uh, about people talking about the warrior gene, the gay gene, the aggressive gene and things like that. So uh, for the general public, I, I guess it's important that people understand that that simply isn't true. It's impossible for a single gene to determine or influence even a behavioral trait because it's right. and extremely I, complex. And I, I think it's even, it's even more complex than that. And I think it's become commonplace for behavior geneticists after they note the fourth law to say, oh, there's not one gene for IQ. It seems there are thousands of genes for IQ, but I don't agree with that either because even those individual genes aren't genes for IQ, that in the sense that uh, 
there's a biological pathway that we understand between the gene and IQ. And we understand that if we, you know, change the value of this gene in somebody, if we could do that, that their IQ point, IQ is going to go up, you know, X points over here. Um, they're not IQ genes in the sense that they affect lots of other things other than IQ. They only affect IQ by interacting with each other and interacting with the environment. What, you know, what it's right to say is that there are a lot of genes, and in some ways better to say a lot of DNA, since we often don't study genes per se, uh, that are correlated with IQ. And uh, exactly how they cause it individually or in combination is very, very problematic. And uh, I think it, it, it's very important that we bear that in mind when we think about the consequences of that kind of knowledge. Because, uh, you know, once, once we, you know, we've identified a lot of these genes or SNPs, little bits of DNA that are correlated with IQ. And the next step is often to want to, and we can now, you know, inexpensively genotype you and genotype me and find out that you have more of the SNPs that make people smart than I do and say, well, there, now we know why he's smarter than Eric. It's because it's because he has these SNPs that cause high IQ. And that's a really serious overstatement. You know, you, you have a bunch of DNA. That oh, by, by the way, just to interrupt you there, and for the public, SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Little individual units of ACGT. Um, it, it's the, the little tiny units that genes are made out of. And uh, it's the, for mostly practical technological reasons, it's become the standard way how to, how we investigate the relationship between DNA and outcome because they can, we can assess millions of them at a time very inexpensively in people. So we can get for a few hundred dollars, you know, a few million SNPs from a couple of hundred thousand people and on, of whom we also know their IQ or whatever. And so a lot of the modern studies are based on that technology. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And so would you say that even when we do uh, GUA studies, genome-wide association studies, that the results we get from them are mostly uh, correlational? They're, yes, they're strictly correlational, which isn't to say they're meaningless. Uh, I mean, you know, psychology... Behavioral sciences have been based on correlations in a lot of ways for a long time. And you can learn interesting things from studying patterns of correlations, but it's also important not to get ahead of yourself and assume that those correlations are straightforward causes that you understand because you can get in a lot of trouble i mean a lot of intellectual trouble if uh you know there's a a standard example not mine that i always like to get out there um you know about a world in which redheaded children uh the culture hates redheaded children uh they they think of them as evil and so when a couple has a redheaded child they isolate them and don't feed them. And the other kids beat up the redheaded kid on the playground. Uh, and the teachers don't pay any attention to them. And when all that is said and done in that world, redheaded kids grow up with low IQs. Uh, and if you were to do a GWAS in that culture, genes for red hair would look like IQ genes. Um, but they're, they're not IQ genes, they're genes that are correlated with IQ. And if it then became possible to understand the causal pathway through which they affected IQ, you'd be able to see that they're not IQ genes at all. Uh, 
And and the truth is, we really don't know anything at this point about how or why the genes or SNPs that we found that are correlated with IQ are correlated. Uh, there are people trying, and it's a it's a perfectly legitimate research effort, but it hasn't borne a lot of fruit so far. Um, it's very hard to do in human beings because we can't do gene knockout studies and we can't operate on people's brains. And uh, so it's very, very difficult science to do. And, and so far we just don't know. So it's, so it's important to be a little bit humble about what those kind of data mean. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, would it even be possible or would any amount of evidence ever tell us that, for example, if we were to find uh, or to single out uh, a set of genes, even if they were in the thousands, associated to a particular trait, that there was there some sort of cause-effect relationship between having that set of genes, even if it were again in the thousands, and that particular trait, would it be possible? And if yes, what would it tell us? That, that having those genes was the single cause behind that particular person expressing that behavior? Yeah, I mean, I don't... I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's, I, I don't think it, I mean, I don't think it will ever happen. And I don't think it's very likely because I think our, our brains and the relationship between our genes and our brains are too plastic and, and malleable for there to be a fixed set of genetic relationships. Um, I mean, one thing we know about complex genetics is that any given set, any given genetic configuration can, is capable of producing a whole lot of phenotypic outcomes. And uh, now, I, gu I guess you can imagine things that m might happen. I mean, there are people who think it's going to happen. I mean, there are serious people who think it's going to happen. So you could, for example, I mean, it's very, very hard to do in people, but you could, you know, most, most genes are uh, homologous in lower animals. So you could, in theory, identify some set of genes that you think are important and then study the consequences of those genes in rodents or dogs or primates um, and do breeding experiments or knockout experiments and and follow the pathways between the genes and what happens in the brains and whatever equivalent of intelligence you can derive in those organisms. Um, I don't want to say it's impossible. It's I, I think what's right to say is that we're not anywhere close to actually having that kind of understanding and there's no reason to think that the inexorable progress of science means that it's necessarily going to happen. I think there are a lot of people who assume that, well, boy, genetic technology just keeps getting better and better and better. And that means that sooner or later, we're going to understand all human differences genetically. That it's sort of, it's got to happen. How could it not happen? Um, but I don't think that's the case. Uh, you can't always explain complex phenomena from the bottom up. And, uh, So I, I don't, I certainly don't expect it to happen anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and so uh, another idea that comes from behavior genetics, and I, I guess it's related to the shared environment now, uh, is that as the environment improves, irritability uh, de uh, increases and as the environment impoverishes, irritability decreases. Is is it that way, or, or am I uh, putting it uh, backwards? Zero? Uh, or, and could you explain this, please? Yes. Uh, well, I've uh, 
I've, I've conducted a series of studies that actually followed up on work that had gone before, um, suggesting what you say, that the heritability of this of intelligence is lower in, that these studies are done by and large in twins, in twins reared in relative poverty, uh, as opposed to twins reared in middle class or better off families. Now, the, the caveat on there, but there, since my first report of that, uh, people have looked at it a lot. Uh, it's been meta-analyzed, that is, reviewed quantitatively, and led to a fairly clear conclusion that that's a phenomenon that happens in the United States, but not so much in well, mostly Europe uh, or maybe Australia. Um, and I don't think we know why that is exactly. The, the obvious reason is that there is much more economic and I think especially important educational inequality here. Um, you know, we don't have a national school curriculum and we don't have, by and large, federal funding of schools. So kids born to in to impoverished parents in bad neighborhoods go to the worst schools and the poorest kids go to almost completely dysfunctional schools. And uh, I can't prove it, but I think that's the driving force behind it. Uh, and we're, we're working now, just by the way, we're trying to understand the, the mechanism. Why, why does that happen? And I think what's what's interesting is that I mean if you know it's it's I mean it's the way we've always put it that heritability heritability is lower in poor families than in better off families but when we talk about heritability in twins we're really talking about identical and fraternal twin correlations uh, and if heritability is higher and heritability is basically the difference between the identical twin correlation and the fraternal twin correlation um, because they're more genetically similar. So if we're saying that heritability is higher in well-off families, we mean that either the identical twin correlation is higher or the fraternal twin correlation is lower or both uh, because that's what produces a heritability. And it's complicated. It's hard to get really steady results, but lately it seems fairly clear to us that this phenomenon happens because in well-off families, fraternal twins become more different. And that, that suggests, I, I think, a very interesting mechanism for why this happens. That if, if you're in a, if you're, you and your fraternal twin, who's just your sibling, really, um, are raised in a really good environment with lots of opportunities, and one of you, for whatever reason, happens to be a little better at math than the other one, maybe for some genetic reasons or some fairly random reasons. Well, in a good environment, in a good school, there are resources to direct you to to learn more math, put you in the advanced math class with the excellent math teacher, um, and then eventually move on and go to university in math. Um, and so the, what starts out as a small difference between you means you can get exposed to different environments that pushes you apart over time. Whereas if you're born into a really terrible neighborhood uh, with lousy schools and no resources, it doesn't really matter what kind of abilities you have, right? So they're, they're, you don't have those resources to seek out. And so identical twins don't differentiate as rapidly. And therefore, heritability doesn't go up. Anyway, I mean, that's a little technical, but it's just what we're working on right now. So I'm interested in it. Yeah, right. So and now another thing that I think adds nuance to the study of behavior genetics, that is gene environment correlations. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain the concept and also talk a, a little bit and distinguish between the three main types, active, reactive, and passive gene environment correlations. Uh, yeah, I hope I can get those right. Those are, <laughs> those are 
those are not my ideas originally. But I mean, I've been talking a lot about gene environment correlation uh, already. I mean, my my story about the red haired kids uh, right. was a story about gene environment correlation that that in that in that culture, children with genes for red hair get exposed to really bad environments. Uh, so the idea is that genes and environment aren't independent of each other. Um, and the and of course, over over time, that's true for everything. Now, let me see if I can do uh, active, passive and react reactive. Uh, yes. Um, uh, I'm probably going to get this wrong. Um, passive gene environment interaction would be uh, if if your parents simply decide to treat two kids in the same family differently because of their phenotype. I'm going to get it wrong. Let, let's not. I, I don't. It, uh, is, uh, isn't the passive no. gene environment correlation about the fact that perhaps parents, because they share the same genetics as the child, yes. uh, create an environment yes. no. that, that no. goes along with the genetics? Uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, and then the active is when the, the person by, by himself or herself seeks activities or environments that go along with their natural proclivities, right? Right. And then reactive is if you exhibit traits that then cause your parents to treat you differently. So the kid who starts acting out and being a juvenile delinquent uh, is going to evoke different kinds of environmental reactions from the parents. Uh, and and also from other people, right? For example, the right. teachers and... Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, the most important thing about gene environment correlation is of all kinds is that in simple twin models it winds up looking like a genetic effect because one way or another it means that people with more similar genes get exposed to more similar environments and if those environments then have an effect well that those effects are going to be correlated with the original genetic differences. Um, so it, it's one of the many reasons you have to be a little careful about a simple twin study because, you know, a basic MZ and DZ twin study isn't capable of identifying those kinds of processes. Uh, more elaborate twin, twin and family studies are, uh, Though it's a very, you know, it's a very difficult thing. Um, and to me, it's all a way of getting back to what I was saying before, that the, re the relationship between genes and complex behavior is almost never, and I only say almost to avoid saying completely never, a matter of you have these genes that cause certain kinds of behavior and the genes express themselves and the behavior happens. Uh, complex genetic development involves genes that are inputs into an incredibly complex developmental pathway that invokes different kinds of environments and which changes the kind of person you are, which then changes how your genes are expressed, which leads to other kinds of environments. Um, and there's an outcome on the other side that winds up correlated with the genes you started with. But the pathway between point A and point B is always super, super complicated. Um, so you know, I used the word humble before. I think it is always a good idea to 
be humble about how much we know about the way all these things work. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And would you say that perhaps uh, one thing that could be behind the fact that in a lot of studies, when we study, um, when we do, for example, longitudinal studies and we follow up people from childhood to adulthood and we verify that there are certain traits, certain psychological traits uh, that uh, change or get exaggerated as they become more independent from their parents, for example. Would you say that could be an example of active gene environment correlation? Because as people become more and more independent, they have more freedom to try to find the environments that, that are more in tune with their natural proclivities. Exactly. I mean, you see that very strongly for IQ, where in children who are of an age where they still live with their parents, uh, it's a, it's a, that's one of the rare situations where you do find a measurable shared family component. Um, you know, C, as we say, uh, and for the common environment. And, uh, but as kids pass through adolescence into young adulthood, that portion gets smaller and smaller, and depending on who you talk to, maybe even goes away. I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think it does go away. But in any event, everybody agrees. And I think that's exactly because people by then, by the time you're in your 20s, you're no longer living in your parents' environment. You're living in an environment that, to a large extent, you've created and or has been created for you. And, and so if you, if you think about the, the course of the life course of you and your siblings, I think for most of us, we become more different from our siblings over time, if you stop to think about it. And I think the reason for that is we start to become a certain kind of person, and that causes us to seek out a certain kind of environment, which reinforces that kind of person that we've become, which then makes us even more different. Um, and Again, that's something where it, that's a very hard thing to demonstrate in data. It's it's easy to see in the real world, but it's it's really hard in data, and we're we're trying to find ways to model it and quantify that uh, that yeah. process of drift over a lifespan. Yes, uh, and what is the difference in behavior genetics between gene environment correlations and gene environment interactions? Well, we've just been talking about gene environment correlations, uh, which is people with certain kinds of genes being exposed systematically to certain kinds of environments. Um, interactions are statistical interactions where the, the effect of a gene depends on the environment in which it's expressed. Uh, so, you know, classic genetic gene environment interactions are, uh, you know, plant genes that, that maybe create tall and short plants uh, if when the plants are raised at one temperature, but have a different kind of effect on the plants if they're raised in a warm environment and things like that. The, the, the heritability of IQ stuff that we were describing where the heritability is higher in middle class environments than it is in poor environments is an example of a certain kind of gene environment interaction, a, a twin level gene environment interaction, because the heritability of behavior depends on the environment in which the twins were raised. Um, uh, people have spent a lot of time looking for gene environment interactions for actual genes now that we can do that that proved that's proven to be a very difficult thing to do uh exactly well for the reason we were talking about that even the main effects of individual genes are very small and hard to detect well interactions are an order of magnitude more 
harder to affect, uh, harder to detect than main effects. And so there's been kind of a history of thinking that we find very well. Uh, it's, it's hard to do. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's perfectly well established that especially complex behavior that's contributed to by many genes, it's another way of saying what I said before, genes don't have fixed effects that you can count on happening in all situations. The, the consequences of having a particular gene depends on a lot of other things. Uh, the environment, for example, which is a gene environment interaction, also maybe on what other genes you have, which are gene gene interactions. Uh, you know, the genetic name for that is epistasis. Um, and you know, it's very, very far from a one to one this gene produces that outcome kind of system. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there are also very complex behavioral traits, psychological behavioral traits that um, that only get expressed if that particular person is exposed to certain particular life events, right? So, for example, there are some people that even though they are genetically predisposed to depression, if they are not exposed to a stressful environment with certain characteristics that could uh, cause the expression of that trait, in this case depression, that wouldn't ever happen, perhaps, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's hard to show, it would be hard to show that in any particular case, uh, because it's, I don't think you could, other than saying they have a first degree relative, uh, I, don't, I don't think you could really identify somebody per se who has a genetic predisposition to the depression. Um, there, there's interesting work that goes on uh, in alcohol, uh, looking at how uh, effects of how heritability of alcoholism or alcohol use changes when there are big cultural changes that change the availability of alcohol. Um, and... Uh, you know, alcoholism is much more heritable in cultures that provide easy access to alcohol than in cultures where it's very difficult to come by alcohol, uh, which which makes perfect sense. Um, and uh, and those those are good examples of gene environment interaction. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you've already talked a little bit about intelligence and IQ. And last week I interviewed Dr. James Flynn. So um, I would like to ask you if, if you agree with him when he says uh, two different things that I asked him. The first one is that um, IQ in terms of the, num the number uh, a certain person gets when they do the test, they perform the test, uh, is much more the result of environment than genetics. Uh, and on the other hand, and he also agreed with this, is that uh, the genetic part of IQ, uh, what it tells us is that there's a upper limit to IQ uh, for each individual that is genetically imposed. Do, do you agree with both these, these assessments? James, James Lee? Uh, uh, J James Flynn. Oh, James Flynn. Yeah. Um, uh, so the first part was that in any individual, the environment is more important than the genes. Is yes, to, to allow for that particular individual to reach uh, a certain IQ? I get, I, I, I don't know that I agree that you can quantify it that, that way. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that he's, that I would say that's wrong, but, uh, you know, the way I like to look at it is in terms of the, how different even identical twins are in IQ. And identical twins, uh, 
it's not at all uncommon for identical twins raised together to differ by as many as 10 or 12 IQ points. And uh, so I... Now, whether that suggests that more of it is environmental or genetic, I don't know. I, I, I'm not... I, I actually don't think that's a very good question. I think there's plenty of environmental variability in the IQ a person is going to achieve conditional on the genome they're born with. Uh, how Exactly how you quantify it, I don't know. Now that, that question about setting an upper limit uh, th that w that would be genetically determined. That means because of the particular set of genes that person has, uh, even if she was put into the richest environment possible, that she wouldn't ever be able to get beyond beyond a certain IQ. Let's say. I don't. I don't. I don't know how. How, how Jim Flynn thinks he knows that. I mean, it's a good intuition. And, uh, you know, we know in general that both genetically and environmentally that it's much easier to lower IQ than it is to increase it. Um, because there we know a lot, not in the normal range, but there are lots of genes that cause severe uh, mental disabilities and low IQ. We don't know of a single gene that if you have it, it substantially increases your IQ. We don't know a single one. Um, and it's really the same on the environmental side, that we know lots of kids raised in poverty and hungry and eating lead paint. All those things have terrible effects on IQ. I mean, we know that education is good for IQ. It's a little easier to talk about things that are environmental things that are positive for IQ. But all in all, it, it's much easier. Uh, but well, I, I worry about when he puts it that way, that it makes it sound like we could use somebody's genotype, that we could you know, genotype a baby in the womb and and actually say the maximum IQ that this person is capable of is 117 or something. And the fact of the matter is we can't do that. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a theoretical way, it seems reasonable to say that we start out with sort of an ideal possibility of having a very high IQ and then things go wrong genetically, environmentally, and developmentally that lower our IQ. But in the practical world, uh, it, it's not really true. Um, and I, you see, I think another thing about, I mean, I think we all have that intuition. I'm going to have to go in a couple of minutes, just by the way. Um, I, I had it scheduled for an hour. I hope that's okay. But uh, um, uh, we all have that. If, if you know, I think about myself and think, well, could could I tomorrow be start being a great theoretical physicist and or a great mathematician? And and the answer is no. And the, and the reason is I don't, I'm not smart enough, you know, I, I can't do that stuff. And, and it's easy to think because by now, and for most of my life, that, that seems like a fixed characteristic of me. I don't remember a time when I felt like, oh, well, if I worked a little harder or led, led my life a little bit differently, maybe I could be way, way smarter than I am. And, and because we experience it that way, it's easy to think, well, that maximum IQ must be fixed in my gene somewhere. But I'm not sure that's true. That what's true is that 
by the time we are aware of how smart we are or aren't, that trait has become very fixed and it's hard to change. Um, but I, I don't know what kind of developmental processes went on when I was growing up and in the womb and in my relationship with my parents when I was little and my peers and what kinds of things might have happened that would have nudged me in a different direction and left me with an IQ 20 points higher than my, my IQ is. Uh, it's really hard. I, I just don't know how you would ever know that the upper limit of my IQ is actually fixed in my genes rather than saying it got fixed somewhere early in my developmental trajectory. That's, that's a, a complicated argument, but uh, it's, it's a really important one because that's what we always want to know is what could our IQ have turned out to be given the genome that we were born with? You know, that, that, that's what we want to know. And in, in human beings, that's a super hard thing to find out. Uh, yeah, 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 it's very complicated. And uh, I think you gave a very good answer to it. Uh, so uh, so you, you have to go now and we will end it there. And Dr. Turkheim, I would really like to thank you again for taking the time to to come on the show oh, sure. and it, it was a real pleasure talking to you. Oh, good. And if, if you'd like to follow up sometime, I'd be glad to do it again. If you appreciate my work, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash the dissenter. Thank you. <laughs>